So hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, new session at the US R21 2021 conference. Uh, a, so for a trends, markets and uh, models session. Uh, so today you have three uh, wonderful talks that will be uh, delivered during this session. Uh, I hope we'll enjoy them and you learn a lot from uh, the speakers. So uh, my name uh, is uh, Mouna uh, Belaid. Uh, I'm basically an engineer, statistics and data analysis, and I'm a co-organizer at Tunis R User Group. And I'm so pleased to share uh, this session and to uh, so participate in uh, this uh, volunteering work at the User R 2021 conference. Uh, so uh, the first uh, talk. Uh, will be delivered by uh, Harold Poor, and uh, he will cover how to uh, measure global trends using uh, Google Trends and the Global Trends package in uh, in R. Uh, so uh, let me just introduce uh, Harold. So he's a research associate at uh, WU Vienna in Austria, where he's part of the Department for Global Business and Trade, and so his um, research focuses on top topics in a global strategy and international finance. So he mostly uses R for data cleansing and statistical testing, and I'm sure that you will learn a lot uh, from uh, him. So just uh, a reminder that there will be a live caption and uh, so in this uh, session, and so that you can enable or disable uh, it uh, on Zoom. Uh, other last thing, please don't hesitate to uh, leave your questions. Um, in this chat or so please uh, in the don't hesitate to share this in the corresponding uh, so uh, channel in this slack channel as you go along and so this session uh, should be um, as interactive as uh, possible uh, so i think uh, the screen is yours hard uh, thanks a lot <laughs> um so uh, today I'm presenting um, a project I've been working on with my colleague, ja colleague Jakob Müllner, also from VU Vienna, and I'm presenting the Global Trends Package, uh, which is an approach to access and analyze data from Google Trends in order to get an idea about global trends uh, and what's going on in the data provided by Google. Um, so in terms of agenda, I'd like to answer three quick questions today. Uh, first of all, what does Global Trends do, so in terms of functionality? Second, what can you do with Global Trends? So I will be talking about applications. And then why should you care? And this is something the reviews have been pestering us about. So what do we contribute to the community in a wider sense? Um, so what does, uh, what does Global Trends do? Why would you need this package? What can you do with that? Um, so, first of all, the Global Trends package allows you to access data and download the data from Google Trends, which gives you an idea to analyze the dispersion uh, and the development of Global Trends. This can be really anything, I'll talk about this a bit later on, uh, with data from Google Trends. So, we include functions for downloads, functions for computing, uh, for preparing the data, uh, functions for exporting, but also some, some plot functions. And since this involves uh, loads of data, uh, also in, in terms of various categories, uh, the data is stored in an SQLite file, so it's a very easy way of, of uh, storing and, and sharing the data. Uh, what we've been thinking of is basically a one-stop solution uh, to work with data from Google Trends, so you can download compute, export, visualize, all with, with this one package. Uh, the package is available on GitHub, and also on GitHub, uh, I've uploaded the presentation and the uh, workable code examples where you can basically see how the package works and what steps you have to take. I think I don't have to tell you, uh, have to tell you about uh, Google, and that Google really has loads of data. Um, I hope some of you already know uh, Google Trends. So this is what the Google Trends portal looks like. You enter a search term and, and you get some data. Uh, I've ent entered the Super Bowl uh, and within your search query, Google normalizes um, the maximum value of your search query to 100. 
So as you can see, that's the, the green dot. Uh, during the Super Bowl weekend, the search volumes for the Super Bowl in Austria were at the maximum. So this is where 100 was. And this, this is the value is normalized to 100. Uh, however, when we extend the time period, the normalizing basically starts from the beginning. And so the 100 from before, the green dot, becomes a week 50, more of a 40. Also, if we add additional keywords, so in this case, Champions League, which is way more relevant in Austria than Super Bowl, you see that the 100 from the first slide is now yeah, more of, of a 10 or a 50. So this is quite a big problem when we think about large scale uh, data comparison and analysis. So what our package does uh, in order to, to overcome this is renormalization. So we have object keywords and control keywords. Object is what we are actually interested in. So in the previous example, the Super Bowl or the Champions League. And the control keywords, they should more or less mirror the standard usage uh, yeah, of internet, internet in a given location. So instead of having data relative to the search query, so as we had before, we transform the data to relative to um, yeah, standard internet usage, so these control terms. So we, we've made some good experiences uh, with, with these examples that you can see here, but we know that they're context dependent, so you might have to play around with these. But so far, the experiences have been, been quite good. So instead of looking at the search volumes as we have them on Google Trends, what the package does is to transform them to a search score, which is, as I said, relative to standard internet usage. And the idea is that this makes it comparable across locations, across terms, and, and gives really super cool detail to the data, which I will show you uh, later on. Uh, in the package, we include two measures for internationalization. The first one is the degree of internationalization, which is more in terms of dispersion. So how equally distributed are search volumes across the globe? So are people in the US, in the UK, in Japan, Russia, and Australia equally interested in a given topic? So if this distribution is very equal, then you have a high degree of internationalization. Um, we measure this in terms of an inverted uh, Gini coefficient. There are some robustness checks included. And this is unweighted data. So the US counts as much as the UK, as Austria, as uh, Luxembourg. The second measure we include is the volume of internationalization, which is more about uh, global search scores. So how relevant really on global level is a topic. So can look at how important globally is the Super Bowl compared to the Champions League, compared to Donald Trump or whatever. So these are the two, two measures we use in this package, the two measures that allow you to look at the internationalization of global trends. So in terms of workflow, that's actually pretty, pretty simple. Um, and you have more details in the documentation and the example that I've uploaded to GitHub. And the first step is the setup. You have to initialize the database file. You have to connect to the database file that is stored locally. And then you have to add your keywords uh, to the database. It's stored in there. Uh, and then you're good to go to start your, your downloads. So you have to run a few download co um, commands. So first you have to download the control data, so your baseline data. And then you can download the object data, so whatever you're actually interested in. Uh, and this might take some time um, because like, you, you can't send too many, too many queries at the same time to the Google service. Um, but this is kind of the, the, work, the, the, the workhorse functions, let's say. Now that you've downloaded and stored the data to the database file, uh, you compute first the search scores, then the volume of internationalization, and then the degree of internationalization. Now you have all your data. Um, together in your, in your SQL Live file. Uh, there are some export functions uh, that provide you with uh, data frames that you can store directly to Excel or, or CSV files or whatever. Um, and then we have added some visualization functions that build on these exported uh, data sets where you, you can basically visualize the data and prepare some plots, which where I will show you some, some examples later on. 
But in terms of workflow, workflow, that's it. So if you, you will see um, when you look at the example that uh, I've, I've provided in GitHub, it's really not more than 20 lines of code from initializing the database to creating your first plot. So this is a really, really simple approach that, that takes care of basically all the all the things you have to do in order to get a nice data set. So this is how Global Trends works. These are the, the functionalities. So might have been a bit quick. So you might ask, okay, what's the point? What can we do with that? Um, I'll try to answer this question now. Uh, the point where we started was the internationalization of firms. And this is just a quick example of, of six firms from the S&P 500. Um, and let's say in terms of face value, it makes sense. Uh, we in this plot we can see that Coca-Cola, Facebook, and Microsoft are quite internationalized, while more domestic companies where we would expect low degree of internationalization, such as uh, Alaska Air Group or Illinois Toolworks, um, they have very way lower degrees of internationalization, which basically shows that the measures do what we expect them to do. Uh, in case you don't believe <laughs> what you see in face value. In the backup slides of the slide deck, you will also find some robustness checks where we, where we test uh, the validity uh, of our corporate internationalization measures. What you can also see when you look at the box plots is that the, the, distribution, the distribution of, the, of, of this uh, degree of internationalization plots is actually quite, quite dense. So there is, is little noise in there. So this is monthly data and you only have a very few outliers. So it's, it's not distorted by some other trends, but it it's really seems to capture the internationalization of firms. So this is where we, where we started and where you come from. Um, but you can do loads of other stuff with, with this data and with our package. Uh, you can also look at the internationalization of products because all you need is keywords on Google, and this is not limited to firms. You can do this for products, and as you can see, um, the example of the Nintendo Switch or the Tesla Model 3, once, um, uh, once the product got introduced, uh, the degree of internationalization went up. So again, we see that the measures basically do whatever we, we expect them to do. In the case of the Volkswagen Golf, it's, it's way more stable, uh, as you would also expect. You can do this for individuals, for politicians, for athletes, for uh, scholars like Paul Grubman. Uh, and the interesting thing is it make, can, you, it's always the same scale of, of comparison. So you can compare the internationalization of Donald Trump to the internationalization of Kylian Mbappé, to the internationalization of the Volkswagen Golf, uh, but also to the internationalization of Facebook, because it's always the same scale. We've done this for organizations uh, other than firms, football clubs, universities, even terror organizations. Um, you can do it for global trends and, and phenomena like Brexit, the ice bucket challenge, or even COVID. So you see that the COVID got, <laughs> as we've all experienced, got quite international quite quickly. Um, since the data is not limited to country level data, you can also look at within country dispersion as we do here with, with some national newspapers in the US. And for the Boston Globe and Star Tribune, you also see that the, the interest, the search score uh, is highest in, in those states where these newspapers are actually from. So again, the data really shows more or less what we expect the data to show. So we really, really think that this is, is valid. Another cool thing, and then I'm, I'm more or less done with the applications of the package, is that because you have as we provided in the Global Trends uh, package, you have a monthly time series of internationalization measures. You can also do event studies. And we've included some functions to do that so that you can compute abnormal internationalization. So it's similar to event study in finance, we're still working on that. Um, but again, here are two examples of the one of the, the Cristiano Ronaldo transfer to Juventus and then the, the uh, Tiffany acquisition by LVMH. We also think that this this makes sense. So I've convinced you that you can, <laughs> I hope I've convinced you that you can do cool stuff with our package. Um, but you probably have been doing similar stuff already. So you might be asking, okay, why should I care? What's the point of all of that? 
And the answer is always in research is it depends. It depends on who you are. So we believe to academics and practitioners, uh, our package provides systematic access to Google Trends uh, and, and really gives access to an amazing data source that has been applied, but we don't think that it has ever been used in such a very systematic way because this is the, the core aspect. We believe that this renormalization that is integrated in the package, uh, it allows a really large scale data analysis. You're not limited to, to yeah, a few keywords in a few locations, but you can do this on a very large scale. And then the SQLite database file that is, is used to, to store the data makes it very easy to share the data within projects and among colleagues. So for our users, um, we don't want to replace G-Trends R. We know that G-Trends R is there because we actually use G-Trends R. This is what we use to access the Google Trends API. And we never thought about replacing G-Trends R. That is absolutely not our intention. So if your code currently runs with G-Trends R, good for you. I'm, I'm really happy. Keep working on your code. You probably don't need our package right now. But if you think about uh, writing new code to analyze Google Trends, you might want to look into our, our package because it provides a one-stop solution to really a system of functions that, that guides you from uh, downloads to exports to visualization all in one package. And then finally, um, to conclude for our developers, I think our package is a case in point that you really have to adapt your package to the users you want to uh, target. Uh, who is your average user? Think about that in academia, my experiences, and I hope my, my co-panelists can, can prop me up on these experiences. People don't really use R, they have to cope with R. So everything that is beyond Stack Overflow or a tutorial gets tricky. And to these users, we provide the Google Trends uh, package. So depending on whatever you, your, your package wants to do, whom you want to target, you might have to adapt your code to your target audience. So thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, the code, the package, everything is available on GitHub. This is super work in progress. So any comments, any suggestions, bug reports, criticism, whatever, if you find it through GitHub, that's highly, highly uh, appreciated. Thanks a lot and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Harsh, for this um, a great presentation. Hopefully, so dear attendees, you uh, you get a clear understanding about the maturity of this uh, R package. Uh, so I think it's time to move to questions. I have two questions here. So the first one: How um, how can we search for local events? Uh, meaning storm in my hometown, for example, is there a good solution to do that for that? What do you um, think? Actually, that's, that's pretty simple because um, on Google Trends, uh, and therefore also in our package, you can specify the location where you want to wanna get the data for. So it doesn't work on a, a city basis, but on a, on a province basis, so US states. Um, so your keyword of interest, your object keyword would be storm or hurricane. And you would only use as a location, I don't know, uh, the US state of Maine or Virginia or, or whatever your actual location. So this is pretty simple. I'm not sure whether you need our package for that because it's, it's really intended for large scale comparison, but with Google Trends, it's definitely possible. Yeah, all right, awesome. Mm, you have another question from Hernan. Thank you for attending. Uh, is there a limit to the number of requests, so meaning keywords that can be made per session uh, time unit? Yes, but nobody knows what the limit is. <laughs> Google doesn't <laughs> tell us. Um, so our workaround is that we wait around 10 seconds between each download. So this makes it a bit time consuming. We, we know, but that's the only solution that seems to be around. And once you get blocked, uh, I think it, the, the code tries every few seconds whether a download is possible, and then generally one download is possible, then has to wait again. Um, so I don't know what the number of downloads actually is, um, but so for researchers, time isn't that important. So we have the time to 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 wait till the till the, the 
downloads are open again. But the package does this automatically, so you don't have to refresh on a, a certain interval. The package is doing that. Yeah, that's so cool. So uh, please don't hesitate if someone else has a question to leave his uh, question in the chat. I would be happy to uh, to tell her about it. Um, otherwise, uh, don't hesitate also to review the uh, the links of the package. I think uh, so. Um, the Zoom host will uh, share this in the chat. Okay. Uh, otherwise, let's um, let's go uh, to uh, let's move now to the second talk. So, uh, computing disposition effect on financial financial market data, uh, and that will be delivered by uh, so Lawrence Hsu, uh, Matthew Yeli, who's a master graduate in economics and finance finance and also graduate in uh, political science at Università degli Studi di Milano. And also uh, Mark uh, Zenotto, who's another developer and working as a data scientist at T-Voice in Milano. So uh, they will introduce to us the new uh, disposition effect R package. And so that uh, allow me to quickly evaluate the position of uh, disposition effects behaviors uh, of an investor. Uh, investor sorry. Uh, so I think really nice topic. Uh, the screen is yours. Okay. Hi everybody, Marco here from Italy. Today, uh, my colleague uh, Lorenzo and I are going to talk about the disposition effect, which is the R package we developed to perform uh, behavioral finance analysis. So, as Mark said, I'm a senior data scientist and uh, our developer working since uh, five years in a multinational company based in Italy. And here with me, there's uh, Lorenzo, who uh, will introduce the, the theoretical concept of uh, disposition. Hi, everyone. Uh, we can, I think, switch to the other slide, Marco. Okay. So, uh, for the beginning, we must define disposition effect and what it is. The disposition effect is a particular behavioral anomaly uh, related to the tendency of investors actually to sell an asset when it is gaining value on the financial markets, while instead tend to have the tendency of holding the asset when it is losing value. So this is irrational because it was already uh, demonstrated by Jagadish and Titma in 1993 uh, the bad performance stocks in financial markets that have performed bad for the past three to 12 months actually tend to underperform the markets so to keep performing badly in the next three to 12 months. So that's why this disposition effect and the tendency of keeping the losing stock is actually irrational. It is observed in uh, financial and real market data, but also in other, in other situations. So if we move to the next slide, Marco. It was discovered in 1985 by Sheffield and Statman, and the reference paper is made by Odin in 1998 using the US financial market data. Uh, it has been actually demonstrated to be present in uh, real market data for private investors, unexperienced investors, uh, experienced investors, financial institutions, just as uh, Greenblatt and Keluario uh, demonstrated in 2001. And the actual research is actually switching the focus from the single asset level to the entire portfolio level of a single investor. So instead of determining whether the investor has a disposition effect linked to a single asset and the tendency of selling the asset when it is gaining or not selling when it is losing, the focus is at the portfolio level. So if the portfolio is gaining value or losing value. How do we measure the disposition effect? It actually, the difference between these two, these two percentage measure, which we have the realized gains and the realized losses, and at the same time, the paper gain and the paper losses. So what do we have here? The realized gain and the realized losses, actually any time an investor made a trade, is actually selling a stock for a gain or for a profit. And that's basically what is a realized gain or a realized loss. For the paper gain and the paper loss, instead, we have a little bit more complicated situation. So suppose the investor has 500 stocks of a single uh, asset and he sells only partially the stock. So he sells 250 stocks. 
he will remain in the portfolio with 250 stocks. But those 250 stocks in his portfolio are actually a gaining or a losing position, which is not actually realized. So this is a, an opportunity of realizing a gain or a loss, which is not taken by the investors. And that is the measure of the paper gain and the paper loss. So it's actually measure the situation of the portfolio. We make the percentage uh, uh, ratio between the realized gains and the realized losses. So how many times the investor realizes the gain when he has the opportunity to, how many times the investors realizes the losses when he has the opportunity of doing it. And the result of the difference is the disposition effect whenever the measure is greater than zero. So whenever we have the realization of gains greater than the, addition, the realization of losses. Um, why it is important? It is important because as I already said, it has been documented in a lot of different contexts. So we are talking about financial markets, but this is also actually being discovered in house markets, in auctions, also in policy context, because it is really related to the phenomenon of, of endowment effect. Uh, but in particular, this is also important because it has been documented in any time of financial players, such as mutual funds, uh, governmental institutions, as I say, the private investors, whether they are experienced or unexperienced. And in this way, understanding the disposition effect would be really helpful, even for private banks or financial institutions, but also for financial authorities to regulate the markets and managing maybe a situation like really stressful situation, just as the COVID situation in 2020. But at the same time, it is really important because it is an irrational phenomenon. And it actually leads directly to the negation of the classical economic theory and negating the hypothesis of rational behavioral agents. But um, I think I'll leave the stage to my colleague Marco, which will actually present you the technicalities of the package. Okay. So uh, actually, uh, Lorenzo talked to you about the, all the theoretical uh, stuff. So. Because the disposition effect is very important, we decided to develop um, an app package. And uh, you can actually uh, install the development version by, by GitHub, but we are planning to release it on time by, by September. And so let's start talking about the package, its main functionalities, and cover all the steps towards the actual uh, computation of disposition effect. First of all, among the uh, many functions that uh, uh, the package contains, there are four fundamental interfaces. Gains and losses is the core function of the package. This is the function that uh, actually performs the computation of realized and paper gains and losses. Lorenzo has talked to you about this. Uh, it did this uh, under the hood, and uh, this function is uh, a bit complicated. So for this reason, portfolio compute function should be used instead, which is the user-friendly interface uh, uh, to the calculation of the realized and paper gains and losses. Uh, finally, disposition compute and disposition summary allow to easily compute the disposition effect and some aggregate statistics uh, or related to the disposition effect based on the results of uh, uh, portfolio compute. So what, what kind of data uh, do we need to perform uh, the disposition effect analysis? Actually, we need two different uh, types of data frames uh, that uh, needs to be uh, used as input into the uh, portfolio compute function. The transaction data frame, which is uh, um, the data frame containing all the financial transactions of an investor during a specific period of time, and the market prices, that is, the actual prices found on the stock market for each traded asset on each transaction data time. Okay, so the uh, investor transaction data set uh, must contain this, uh, this uh, information, these variables, so it uh, has to contain the investor ID, the type of the transaction, that is, if the transaction is a buy or sell, the uh, asset ID, and also the traded quantity, price, and date time. 
The market price instead needs just these three variables, uh, just to include these three variables, the asset ID, the reference date time, and the reference price found on the, on the, stock, on the stock market for uh, that asset at that uh, date time. So how can we uh, compute the, the disposition effect? Well, well, it is very easy, actually. We, we need just to input uh, these two data frames, the transaction and market prices, into a portfolio compute. This way, we obtain a new data frame containing the realized and paper gains and losses for each asset, as you can see here in the, in the yellow box. Then, we just need to apply the disposition compute function on this result to obtain a value of the disposition effect for each asset here in the red box. And of course, through the disposition summary, we can summarize the results among uh, many investors. So uh, now I would, I would like to spend a few minutes talking about uh, portfolio compute because, uh, as you saw, it is the main uh, user interface of the package. And as I said, it is easy to use, but it is also highly flexible since it allows to perform many different analyses. So let me focus on a few of its most important parameters. The method argument, the allow short argument, the portfolio driven DE and time series DE argument. Okay, first of all, the method argument. It allows to calculate the realized and paper gains and losses based on different methods the standard count middle or total value and duration methods, where total stands for the aggregate amount of traded quantity, value is the expected value of the traded asset, and duration is the total holding period for each asset. The allow short uh, argument instead uh, allows to give, gives the user the possibility to include or not the short selling into the uh, calculations. Okay, then we have two parameters that allow to perform uh, analysis that are really, really at the frontier of the behavioral finance domain. The portfolio driven DE allows to separate the computation of the realized paper gains and losses between positive and negative portfolios, while time series D allows to compute the evolution in time of the disposition effect for the investor. However, if you would like to compute the evolution in time, hence the time series of the disposition effect for specific assets, you can do that by specifying the asset for which you want to calculate the time series disposition effect by means of the parameter asset time series in here. And of course, we have uh, many vignettes for this package. Uh, I, I told you that uh, we are planning to submit it on front, so there is plenty of documentation. And uh, the vignette about the analysis of this position effect uh, show you how to actually use all these, uh, all these parameters in more detail. So finally, let me conclude with uh, a very important topic. That is computational performance, computational efficiency. Well, it is really important because financial data may be used in size. Hence, scalability of computation may be an issue. We have did many tests about uh, all this computation time. Here you can see a small test on a sample of 120 investors uh, with an average of 1,000 transactions. And on average, for an investor with 1,000 transactions, it takes almost 16 seconds to calculate realized and paper gains and losses, that is, to use the portfolio compute function. While using the disposition compute, that is, the actual um, uh, calculation of the disposition effect, is almost instantaneous, as you can see. Okay, this of course depends on the number of transactions and the number of traded assets. But the good news is that portfolio compute computations are embarrassingly parallel among different investors. So if you want to analyze the disposition effect and perform all the computation of uh, realized and paper gains and losses on different investors, that, uh, that um, law is embarrassingly parallel. 
Hence, you can actually parallelize the function easily. And we have also provided a vignette that uh, show you how we can do that different with different parallel possibilities. So on that, uh, thank you very much for your uh, for your attention uh, and for your interest. Uh, if you want to talk more deeply about uh, all this topic, just um, contact me and Lorenzo, and we are very we will be very glad to talk about uh, to talk about this. Thank you so much for for you. Um, this is a great presentation as well. Hopefully, uh, we enjoyed it because I did. So uh, let's move to questions. Uh, yes, you have one question from Max. I think it's interesting. Uh, portfolio transactions uh, at market prices uh, could be hard sometimes to organize. So is there a way to import from a trading platform? Well, this is a very interesting topic. Unfortunately, we don't have it because, as you know, uh, most of the time, trading platform does not allow to have uh, this data for free. So um, most of the time, you have to pay for this. And unfortunately, we can we cannot we were not able to work with this uh, with this kind of uh, API, let's say, that allows to actually import data automatically from uh, from a trading platform but if someone knows how to do this or how to collect data from free trading platform for free of course we can maybe talk about that and try to develop some some api that can do this yeah that's nice so maybe from my side, I would ask a question. Uh, what was the, the most challenging task, I would say, that you, uh, so during uh, the preparation of this work, so what was the, but which step or which task using R? Well, actually the uh, development of portfolio compute, which is the, the, the main function, yeah. uh, let's say it's, it's very huge. It was difficult to, to uh, allow it to use in a very easy way because um, as, as I said, we developed the gains and losses function, which is the, the real core of the package, but it's very difficult to use. So um, the, the most difficult part was to try to, to, to do some function that was easier for the R user that most of the time, when they come from behavioral behavioral analysis domain, they are not comfortable with using R at all. Yeah, that's that's good. That's true. Um, okay, so please don't hesitate if someone else has a question before moving to uh, the last talk. Uh, don't hesitate to, put, to share this on the chat. Okay, I think there is a question. Yes. Uh, functionality uh, means uh, there should be a arbitrage possibility, right? Or so, uh, have you tried a test portfolio strategy using uh, your package? Uh, I will answer the, this question. Uh, we are going to, this is uh, actually a possibility of an arbitrage. Um, for the moment, we are actually working on the package so you're able to determine whether the disposition effect is present or not for all the consequences that you want to derive from the presence of the disposition effect that's up to you i mean we are working on the computation methods okay and how you use the result is up to you it's just research so it actually leads to this possibility and these consequences there is a paper on that which is made by frazzini in 2006 and which is actually link uh, the disposition effect to the possibility of arbitrage in financial markets. And our package actually moves from that starting point and uh, actually the difficulties that Frazzini found out to confirm that disposition effect leads to arbitrage or not. We talk about the possibility of financial regulators to eliminate the arbitrage possibility. Of course, there is also another side of the equation. Yeah, good. Thank you for your answer. We have a question from Levy, so thank you for attending. Uh, can you use daily information in transactions and markets? Yeah, of course. 
they they are daily daily data so mm -hmm. uh, you can actually use any frequency you you want so you can actually work uh, you are not limited to work with uh, close closing price you can work with uh, intra daily data also yeah, that's good. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, your time, for your uh, valuable notes that you, that you shared with the art community. Uh, let's move to uh, the last talk. Okay, so um, estimation methods for uh, markets in uh, equilibrium and disequilibrium that uh, will be delivered by uh, Pantelis Karapana Jotis from the Koiz University, uh, Frankfurt, and so who's uh, also an assistant professor at the Economics and Philosophy uh, University. So uh, during his talk, he will uh, present the R package this egg, so this EQ, so which uh, provides uh, functionality to simplify the estimation uh, estimation of models for uh, markets uh, and this so in equilibrium and disequilibrium using full information so uh, of maximum likelihood methods so uh, let's enjoy this talk together the screen is yours welcome everyone and thank you for taking the time to watch this video i'm very excited about having the opportunity to present the estimation methods for markets in equilibrium and equilibrium that packets DSEC provides to 2021's use our conference my name is padelis karpanayotis I'm an assistant professor at UBS University in Wiesbaden, and I'm also a research affiliate of the Leibniz Institute SAFE in Frankfurt. In most of our work, I, as an economist, as well as most of my colleagues, use models for markets in equilibrium. And this is actually done for quite good reasons. First, equilibrium concepts tend to be analytically very convenient. And second, equilibrium models constitute reasonable econometric approximations that enable us to study our market of interest without giving up too much generality, at least on most occasions. However, on other occasions, this is not the case, and equilibrium models constitute not our most appropriate of choices. As an example, you can see here embedded on this slide a Wikipedia article describing a concurrent ongoing computer chip shortage crisis that I'm guessing most of the people who are interested in this video have either personally experienced or at least heard of. Market models are typically represented as systems of potentially nonlinear equation economics. They can be broadly categorized into two types of models. Market models that embrace the market clearing condition and are typically called equilibrium models and market models that use the short side rule and are typically called disequilibrium models. On the left hand side of this figure, you may see a depiction of a model that embraces market clearing, the condition that is also printed below the figure. The econometric assumption of the market clearing condition is that the traded quantity Q is always equal to the demanded quantity D, which is always equal to the supplied quantity S. Thus, unlike the state of the Schrodinger cut, the state of the market is always known to you as a data scientist or an econometrician. You know that whenever you observe the market, the point that you pick lies directly at the crossing of demand and supply. We know how to estimate this linearly already from the 50s, but in the 70s, many economists were not very fond of this idea of perpetual market clearing, and they began to set up models that use the short side rule instead. A depiction of such a model can be found on the right-hand side of the slide. The main econometric assumption of the short side rule, which is depicted also below the figure, is that we can either observe demanded or supplied quantities depending on which one of them is the smallest. Now, although these models are quite appealing, they become directly quite more difficult to estimate because for starters, the short side rule makes the model non-linear. The most popular estimation method is that of full information maximum likelihood. Despite its popularity, up to recently, there was no standard software implementation that one could use in order to obtain out-of-the-box estimates of these type of models. This led, of course, to duplication of effort, as every researcher had to re-implement the estimation procedure, created issues with respect to the reproducibility of the research output because it is not for standard that in economics the implementation code will be shared 
and also created issues with respect to the comparability of the results because different researchers might have been using different optimization tools, initializing values, stopping criteria, and so on and so forth. The package DSEC aims at filling exactly this gap. The package has three main design goals. Firstly, to provide a simple, approachable, common estimation interface for all the models in the package, irrespective of whether they described markets in equilibrium or disequilibrium. Secondly, is to provide fast implementation routines. Perhaps a 30-40 second difference is not that important when estimating once, but the harsh reality of a researcher dealing with such models is that she will estimate them 100 times. So performance gains are quite significant in our case. And thirdly, the package aims to provide some post-estimation functionality that can facilitate analytics. The common interface design goal is achieved in a typical, if I may say, fashion, namely by adopting an object-oriented all five models of the packets. Concerning the computational performance, the packets employs by default novel analytic expressions for the gradients of the likelihoods of all the models. Although the user may override this behavior, it is typically not advised to do so because there are huge performance gains that are documented also in large-scale benchmarking estimations using simulated data. You will also have the opportunity to see some of the results later on in this video. Concerning lastly the post-estimation utilities, the package offers functionality to calculate predicted demanded and supplied quantities, aggregated quantities, various indices that are helpful in the analysis of shortages, and marginal effects that take into account both sides of the market. From an architectural perspective, the organization of the package is quite typical. There are two backend classes and five frontend classes. The market model class contains all the functionality that is found in all the front-end classes of the packets and acts as an abstract class in C++ terms or an interface in Java terms. There are two derived classes uh, from the market model class, namely the equilibrium model, which is a front-end class, and the equilibrium model, which is still a back-end class. The equilibrium model is a back-end class because there are four distinct disequilibrium specializations and for each of these specializations we get a different front-end class. All five models can be estimated using full information maximum likelihood which essentially boils down to a call to R's opt-in. The equilibrium model can also be estimated to states least squares. I have also experimented with the native optimizer of the GNU scientific library for estimating the equilibrium model without achieving however any significant performance gains in spite of my efforts to parallelize the estimation. Still, the functionality of the GSL optimizer is exposed to the user because the GSL library offers the ability to the user to tweak a little bit more the optimization parameters. In the online vignette, you may find the benchmarking results for all the five models of the package. In this video, we're going to focus only on the basic model as a representative case. The remaining models follow very similar patterns in the results, and the basic model is by far the most commonly used disequilibrium model in the economics and finance literature. The benchmarking exercises took place in the cluster of scientific computing of Getty University, and there were two variations that were conducted for each one of the five models. In the first one, that is represented by the figure that you see on the left, the number of market model parameters was kept constant, and the number of observations was led to exponentially increase. In the second one, that's represented by the figure that you see on the right, the number of observations was kept constant, and the number of market model parameters was led to linearly increase. The benchmarking statistics were gathered by simulating both model parameters and the resulting generated data set. For a data set, for a generated data set to be included into the measurements, it had to pass a series of sanity checks that had to do with the market data balance. And of course, the simulation times were not measured, only the estimation times were measured, and before beginning any measurement, the processors were warmed up by two untimed estimations. For all the benchmarking uh, exercises, the models were estimated using three different optimization options. 
namely BFCS with analytically calculated gradient, BFCS with numerically approximated gradient, and the simplex method of Nelder and Mead. In all of the benchmark, the fastest alternative was obtained by BFCS with analytically calculated gradients. Each point that you see on a solid line of those two figures represents the average estimation time obtained by 100 um, estimations using the simulated data. The dotted line, lines represent one standard deviation differences from the averages. As you can see in the figure on the right, the performance gains obtained by increasing uh, the, when we increase the number of parameters remains almost stable. As you can see in the figure on the left, the performance gains that we obtain as the number of observations increases, increases linearly. As a numerical example, with around 40,000 observations, which could correspond to the benchmarks, to the estimations on the figure of the right, the basic model is estimated 6.43 times faster when the analytic expressions are used in comparison with when they are not used. This would be 10.73 seconds compared to 69.07 seconds correspondingly. Now we can take advantage of the common interface that is provided by DSEC in order to uh, initialize multiple market models while we keep the base underlying specification constant. In this respect, on this slide, we are going to initialize six required variables and two optional variables that are used by the constructors of the models. In line number one, we specify the identifiers of our dataset. In line number two, we specify the quantity columnar data. And in line number three, we specify the price columnar data. Three out of the five models that are provided by DSEC, they have a dynamic component. And for them to be estimated, the calculation of price lags is required. For these models, therefore, we need to specify separately, as we do in line number four, the time columnar data. In lines number five and six, we specify the market structure, namely the demand and the supply equations. The format of the equations follows the classic pattern that is also used in the linear models, and the user should also expect the functionality that is obtained by the linear models. For example, if one passes, uses a factor column in these equations, then the indicator variables corresponding to the levels of this factor column would be automatically created, and the corresponding coefficients would be automatically estimated. In line number uh, seven, the optional variable determines whether the uh, shocks between demand and supply are allowed to be correlated in the estimation. And in line number eight, the verbosity level is set. The verbosity level um, determines the eagerness with which the constructor and subsequent calls to the constructed option will communicate messages to the user, and it ranges from a value of zero, which prints only errors, to a value of four, which prints debug information. Now we can initialize and compare multiple market models based on the same variables. In the first seven lines, we pass the variables to a new call, asking it to construct an equilibrium model. The equilibrium model is static, and therefore we do not need to specify the time column separately. In lines 8 to 14, we use an almost identical new call, with the only difference being that we construct now a basic equilibrium model. In lines 15 to 21, we are asking the new uh, call to construct a directional equilibrium model. The directional model is dynamic, and therefore we have to separately pass to the constructor a time column in this case. Lastly, in line 22 to 28, we have an almost identical to the preceding call, with the only difference this time being that we ask to construct a deterministic adjustment disequilibrium model. The common interface can also be used when estimating constructed model objects. For example, to estimate the equilibrium model that we have previously constructed, we call estimate. In the estimate call of line two, we also pass the additional keyword argument control, which is essentially passed down to the BBMLE call. And as you can see in line one, sets the maximum number of iterations for the optimizer. The results of this and all the subsequent estimation calls are presented in the table below the code block. Estimating the basic model can be done in a very similar manner. By default, 
Estimate initializes the optimizer using a starting values, the estimates of simple linear regressions of the past demand and supply equations. In case the user needs, she can override this behavior by specifying the start keyword, which is also passed down to BBMLE. And for example, we estimate the basic model here using a starting values, the estimates that we have obtained in line two from estimating the equilibrium model. The user also has the ability to directly override the used optimization algorithm. By default, BFGS with analytic gradient expressions would be used, but the user has the ability to switch to nether mid, as for example we do here in the estimation of the directional model. The last two lines of the code block are also estimating the deterministic adjustment model. With this, I would like to close the presentation of the R package DSEC which provides estimation methods for markets in equilibrium and equilibrium by shortly reiterating the main points of the talk. The package provides methods for estimating models that cannot be estimated out of the box using other software, alternative software. It does so by providing a very simple common interface for all the models, irrespective of whether these are models for markets in equilibrium or it's equilibrium. Perhaps the strongest point of the package is the implementation of very fast estimation routines that are using novel uh, expressions for the gradients of the likelihoods of the models. The package lastly provides also post-estimation analysis tools. From my point of view, the most interesting potential future expansion points of the package would be to include additional models, to implement additional estimation methods, or to implement disequilibrium tests. Nevertheless, I would be more than happy to hear suggestions about future expansions from users or potential contributors. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. So um, uh, that has been a really an exciting learning experience about uh, this R package. A really great job. Thank you for sharing this within the R uh, community. Let me check if there is questions there are questions so please don't hesitate to uh, share your questions in the chat i would be happy to uh, to tell the the panelist okay yes you get one questions uh will the slides of this video will be shared uh, yeah. yes I, I think i already shared them uh, with the organizers but uh, yeah i will try I will try to to make for sure that this will happen. Thanks. Yeah, that will be good. Thank you. Uh, yes. So here we have it's all it's possible to review this session on YouTube. So um, already the link is shared on the chat. So don't hesitate to review this later. Um, if there is another question, let me see. Okay. Uh, yes, Mariam also shared the link to package or code repository. So uh, feel free to uh, to uh, to see this and to keep in touch, to keep an eye there. Uh, okay. Uh, so hopefully you, you got also a deep dive um, into the powerful picture features uh, of the different R package that uh, were presented today. I uh, hope you found them um, useful. Um, and personally, I will, uh, so I highly encourage to use them, such work and such contributions make the programming language are more and more powerful. Uh, so uh, next, uh, so after this uh, talk, uh, don't hesitate to join uh, the uh, elevator pitch session. So uh, the elevator pitches, this is the name of, uh, of the channel on, uh, on Slack. Don't hesitate to, to go there and uh, so that will be interactions and uh, so we we'll get uh, networking, etc. cetera. Uh, and also don't forget to get social, meaning so share your attendance with your friends on social media at, um, at the so user r 2021 conference and let's spread uh, valuable knowledge thank you um, so much all for attending and uh, goodbye <laughs>